he tasted death of, Jesus I'm speaking of, by the faith he had. That's how we're saved. By grace, which is what God did in Christ at Calvary, through the faith he had as a man. And we believe from our heart unto righteousness, which is upon him and his work there, and we are saved. Hallelujah. Praise God. And then we get the gift of righteousness, grace, and that gift of like precious faith. It's all a gift. When the Bible says in Ephesians 2, not of yourself, that means no part of it. We only had to believe, but we had to believe. Praise God for that. And I don't have my announcements up here. I don't guess I have any announcements then. Uh, nothing's coming up, pretty, anything immediate that we need to announce, so we'll just skip those tonight. And uh, the teens, I guess, can go ahead and go to class. We'll get early start. That don't mean nothing. And uh, I'm feeling, uh, didn't we have a great service Sunday morning? Pastor Colton Hill preached a, a wonderful message. And I'm telling you, it was, a, it was a right on time, as we like to say, message. If you didn't get to hear it, please go to our YouTube channel, Curtis Hutchinson 316, and there you will find it under the, click on playlists, and there's all sorts of playlists. Click on guest ministers, and there's where we slide all of our guest preachers into that category. And so uh, you can find him and the message he preached Sunday morning there or on my Pastor Curtis Facebook page, either one, and uh, praise God. We're going to be in Revelation chapter 3 tonight. I've been talking about, we're going to teach this, going to preach this, going to talk about this over the last several weeks, and this, this evening will be the night we do that. Uh, the church in Sardis, we're going to just look at it in first six verses tonight. We're going to work our way through this. And uh, pray the Lord give us what we need from this. We need to be equipped for the work of the ministry. We need to have something to say because of who we are and what we have. Did you hear me? We need to have something to say because of who we are and what we have. We're not better than anyone, but we've been equipped and we're still being equipped with the truth of God's word. You know, uh, today the church should be in the greatest revelation of all. Some 2,000 years after Christ, we should be walking in a brighter light than we've ever walked in before. And I believe that the Lord is, uh, just as he spoke through Daniel and said in the last days there's going to be an increase of knowledge. Well, that's not just talking about cell phones and, and little things you can hold in your hand and control the world. It's talking about the increase of knowledge, the, the most important knowledge, the knowledge of the Word of God. God, that he told Daniel to seal this up until the last days. There's some things being unfolded by God now in the last days unto those who believe. But it's only to those who believe. And the only people who are those who believe correctly are those who maintain their faith in the sacrifice of Christ. Everybody else is believing in themselves or a preacher or some work or something. But in believing in the eyes of God is to believe in Christ and what he's accomplished at Calvary. And that puts you in a place now where God can begin a work and continue a perfect work in you until the day you're with him. And uh, we are very blessed to have what we have here at Crossway Church, a people who don't fight and bicker and complain. There's a little bit of that that pops up every once in a while, but it's because we forget what we've got and we, we're, we, we grow weary and we become unthankful. But when the Lord quickens us, we realize what we've got and we uh, slap each other on the back and say, let's keep moving, and we keep moving. Amen? But the most important thing for the church is to be equipped with the truth because false doctrine runs rampant today. It is the majority of what's being taught, that which is false. I'm going to say it again. It is the majority of that which is taught in pulpits is false, even though the Bible is being used. And we, we might discuss a little bit of that tonight. But in chapter 3 of the book of Revelation, verse 1, uh, the Bible says, uh, And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write. Now, we could stop right there and just stay on the kindergarten level and know that John wasn't writing to an angel in heaven. The word means messenger, and it was the pastor of the church in Sardis who he's writing to. You see how simple that can be solved. Well, what, what, what's that angel? What's that man? Well, it's the, you, you, we're not really called. Uh, we are told, actually, we are told, uh, Paul told Timothy to read the word. Read the word. But that means study the word. 
It's not just something for us to look at and glance at. When we get in the Word, it's something for us to get something from. The Word of God is a light to our path so we can see more clearly where we're going and how to function and what's going on. Because if we really don't know what's going on, we're not going to be able to function like we should. And we'll just get in the flesh like everybody else. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. The seven spirits of God speak of the seven attributes of the Spirit of God that you can actually, if you want to, uh, why don't we go to Isaiah chapter 11. Uh, and I've got a note here. I'll read it to you. Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 5. You can make a note of this. Write this down. Most of you are Bible scholars. You have been for years theologians here at Crossway Church. I'm glad. And, uh, but in verse 1 of Isaiah 11, the Bible says, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Now, can we just stay there for a second? I can't hardly talk without wanting to break something down, and it's so good because this is talking about Jesus and and the church. Watch this. And there shall come forth a rod, that's the authority of the stem of Jesse, that's talking about Jesus. And a branch, he's the vine, we're the branches. He's the stem, we're the branches. And a branch shall grow out of his roots. Jesus is that righteous branch, but he's also the vine that we're the branches off of. And so this is talking about Jesus here prophetically. In verse 2, the Bible says, And the Spirit, and watch this, the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom, the Spirit of understanding, the Spirit of counsel, the Spirit of might, the Spirit of knowledge, and the Spirit of the fear of the Lord, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, that's the word of God, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. Now he's talking about Jesus here, okay? So when he says, the, uh, These things saith he that has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, which by the way, the seven stars are the seven churches, and the Bible in Revelation tells us that. But it's talking about Jesus here. Jesus is the one who gave this revelation. However he gave it to John, he gave it to him to give to the church in Sardis. The church in Sardis was in trouble. The church today is in trouble. Thank you for that. Let me say it again. The church today is in big trouble. And he, and he tells them, he says, I know your works. The Lord knows your works. Listen, church, please don't live in a way that you've got everybody faked think you've got everybody fooled and faked out because God's not fooled. He's not faked out. He sees our works. He, and let me say this tonight, and we'll see this as we dig through this, these few verses of Scripture. He is very, our works are very important to him. And we're going to see tonight, they do not save us. But let me tell you, they are highly important to him because without these perfect works he's looking for, he cannot be seen, he cannot be experienced, his will cannot be carried out. Works can't save us, but he is very interested and his works are very important to him and we'll see just how important they are in these scriptures tonight. There's been so much false doctrine through the years that make it sound like works really don't matter. It doesn't really matter. This is the word of God and these scriptures tonight will prove they matter in a massive way to God. His eye is on the sparrow but it's on you and your works too. He called you unto good works, Ephesians 2.10. He called you unto good works. He ordained you unto good works and you are his workmanship, Ephesians 2.10. And that means as long as we let him work in us through the way he began the work, then that work will be perfect. And we're going to see all that. I don't want to get ahead of myself tonight. But he says, I know your works, and you have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. Now, this is most of the church today. 
all over the world. They have a name. These churches have a name. Man, you should come to our church. We got so much going on, and we're the talk of the town. And my Lord, we've got the biggest building. We've got the most programs. We're a church alive. And let me tell you something. If the work is not perfect, God is not pleased. And we're going to see that. He said, listen, he tells this people, you got a name that you're alive, but you're dead. What do people do with that? Well, what did Peter do when Jesus turned to him and said, get behind me, Satan? Well, Jesus surely didn't mean that that was the one that fell from heaven, but he was operating as the one of the spirit of the one who fell from heaven. Peter wasn't Lucifer himself, but he was acting as though he was operating of that spirit. Jesus told him why. He savored the things of men more than the things of God. That's the problem in the church in Sardis. That's the problem in the church in America. This is the reason for the second reformation that we're in right now. It's to bring back, it's to bring the church back to the place where God can work in the church many many years and I'm not talking 50, 100 I'm not talking 500 I'm not talking 1,000 I'm talking near 1,500 close all, might as well say almost the entire church age the church as a whole has not known the way to live for God they've not known how to live in victory but we're learning that today. I'm not saying no one has known that, but the church as a whole, thats you can read books and men tap all around it, but they're not teaching on how to live for God. They're not sharing that because they don't know. I still see people posting things all over preachers, all over Facebook. Even some of them send me personal messages, and they're not of the way. They're not of the message of the cross, and, 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 you know, and I just respond to them uh, with the truth of the Scripture that they sent me. They send scripture, I send them the truth of that scripture back to them. How it relates to Jesus who is the truth of the scripture. And what he did at Calvary is what makes him that to us. But to be sitting in a church and to get a letter for the preacher to get up and read the letter, we've got a letter from the Lord through John that says we're a church that thinks we're alive but we're dead. I remember a woman came in our church years ago, not the cross-preaching church we have, but years ago she walked into the church we were in, and after it was over, uh, she stood up and said, the Lord sent me in here to tell this church to repent. We all looked at her like she needed to go back in the insane asylum. Because if you don't, and you're not following the message of the cross, you're going to think you ain't got much to repent over. Because you're not looking unto Jesus. You can't be. Amen. <coughs> Might be a little tough tonight every once in a while. We'll make it though. Think about that. He tells them you're dead. So what was dead about them? But they weren't dead. <coughs> Just like Peter wasn't Lucifer. They weren't dead, but their faith was dead. Faith without works is dead. <clears throat> and the Lord won't mind showing up telling you, you're dead. Well, my Jesus wouldn't tell me that. You don't know who Jesus is. That right there is where most of the church is. Jesus wouldn't tell me I was dead. Jesus wouldn't rebuke me. Jesus wouldn't uh, <clears throat> do many of the things that it's written about he did and many of the things he taught. When they stand before him, it's going to be a, a rude awakening. This little sweet Jesus. I'm talk, I ain't talking about the great white throne. I'm talking about the judgment seat of Christ. <clears throat> These people who were Christians, yes they were, but they lived their entire lives. And they're going to barely make it in and everything else is going to be burnt up. Everything. Because it wasn't him able to do the work. But it's a dangerous place, and we're going to see that in the scripture tonight. It's a dangerous place to be where you're rocking along there and you're just living your life after your own desires and you're not living according to the word of God. You're not allowing the Lord to work in you, change you, and do things through you. It's a dangerous place. And the scriptures here just in the first six verses prove that you can have your name blotted out of the Lamb's book of life if you don't repent from this place of being dead.
Now, I know our Baptist friends, they won't believe that because they're all hung up in the damnable heresy of once saved, always saved that John Calvin taught. How many of you know John Calvin also taught Jesus had to go to hell and suffer? You do know that. Oh, yes. Research it. You'll find it. I heard John Rosenstern say it this morning, sent me on a trail to search it out. There it is. He taught it. See, one false doctrine just leads to another. Because Galatians 5 says heresy is of the flesh. It's a work of the flesh. That's why that's a damnable heresy. Once saved, always saved gives the fleshly Christians. How many of you know we still got a flesh that love to have its way? We don't want to get up and go to, go to work every morning. We, man, when people driving too close to us, somebody, you know, I didn't even pull out in front of the motorcycle Sunday afternoon, but I got close to doing it. I never entered the road, but I jumped up there like I was about to leave, and, and the motorcycle guy saw me, and, and I guess it freaked him out. I never even got in the road, but he saw me kind of shoot up there real fast, and he shook his finger at me when he went by, and he pounced me with his fist on the way by. And I'm going to tell you something, this old preacher, it's a good thing we ain't got no magic. Because just in a split moment, how many of y'all know what I'm talking about? In just a split moment, there's no telling what I would have done to him just for shaking his fist at me. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I didn't wear a robe in here tonight floating two foot off the ground. I'm real and you're real and when things happen, we got a flash. Now, where was I going with that? Never mind. We've got a flesh. Oh, yeah. Once saved, always saved, feeds the flesh. Well, I don't have anything to worry about. You remember the, the big Baptist preacher who's in Atlanta, Georgia, probably the biggest Baptist church maybe in America. Uh, what's his name? Charles Stanley back in the 90s had a book, Unconditional Eternal Security. I had the book, read the book. Yes, I owned the book. Eventually threw the book in the trash. But it says in that book that even after, after you're born again, even if you renounce Christ, say you don't believe it and turn away and reject him, you're still saved because you can't lose your salvation. That's ridiculous. There's too many scriptures, and this is one of them right here. We'll see it tonight. In these first six verses, the danger of not allowing the Lord to continue the work in you, there's a danger there of your name being blotted out. And one of the commentaries I recently read said, it doesn't say your name will be blotted out. It says, if you, it says your name won't be blotted, blotted out. Yeah, if you repent. How many of you know America so ingrained with once saved, always saved, even those of us sometimes are intimidated to even talk against it? <clears throat> There's a power there that comes from, here's what, here's what allows that mess to stand, us not being equipped and having the boldness enough to tell them that's not right. That's not right. Well, I'm, I'm going to tell them it's not right. And this, this is just one of many scriptures that refute that. But he tells them they're dead. Your faith is dead. You, you, your faith is no good. If, if Jesus says you're dead, that means your faith is not functioning. Because it's your faith that gives you the experience of living. If he says you're dead, that means you're not living. That means there's something wrong with your faith. Okay, we good with that? He says then, be watchful. And strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. Now you can't read this and not realize that, that the Lord is very, our works are very important. Again, you do not work your way into heaven. But here's the problem with not allowing the Lord to work in you to change you and to work through you to affect the world you live in is really a denial of the Lord. If you're dead, you're denying the Lord. Kind of quiet up in here. If Jesus tells you you're dead, that means we, as a Christian, that means we've been denying him what he needs to be doing because he is our life. If he tells me I'm dead, I'm not letting the one who is my life function in and through me. 
Remember what Jesus taught in John 15, 5? Every branch in me that bears not fruit, my Father will pluck it out. There's another one. You just can't refute that. Now, they can change the meaning, and they will if their mind always goes back to, I can't be lost now, but they can. And there's going to be many at the great white throne judgment declaring what all they did, and they did do those things, but there came a day when they began to deny the Lord and refuse him to work in their midst. Think about it. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. The only things, and, when, and really I'm going to share something with you. You can take it and run with it, do with it what you want to. But the word remain there, and, and now, now this is over my head, so don't come after me. Uh, the word remains here is a masculine plural of a derivative. I ain't got a clue what that means. I'm not an English teacher. But the word remains here is a masculine plural of a derivative, and it means the remaining ones. The remaining ones. So let's read it in that way. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain, the remaining ones that are getting ready to die. See, not everybody there is dead, but everybody there is getting ready to die. And he says, strengthen that which remains. That's what the Lord's doing today through the message of the cross. He's strengthening those who remain. Those who are alive and remain. Anybody ever heard that scripture? That's talking about remain in the faith. Remain in a place of living. Be watchful. You, can't be, you ain't never seen a dead man watching. He's telling them, you're dead. Dead folk can't watch. Only those who are alive can watch. Jesus told Nicodemus, you can't enter the kingdom. You can't even see it unless you're born again. Eyes come open when your faith is in the blood. Eyes stay open when your faith is in the blood. When you move faith to something other than the blood, the government of 12, the works of anything we're doing, even our giving, our pray, anything our faith goes into other than the cross of Christ, our eyes go blind. Peter wrote about it that you can go blind again and if you forget you were purged from your old sins. That means if you take your faith out of what Christ did at Calvary, you go blind again. And if you're blind, you're dead, and you cannot watch. The message, notice this, the message is to those who are not dead yet. Mm, that you, that you, that you, He's been able to bring you back to the only place that's living, the place of faith. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. See, the Lord's going to show up in your life. He's going to bring a warning. Thank God that you heeded the warning. And I know the question comes out, well, why didn't they all heed the warning? Why didn't all my family heed the warning? I don't know. Why didn't when Moses came down off the mountain and said, who's on the Lord's side, why didn't they all throw the golden calf away and come out? I don't know. It's a choice we make. We're not robots. They just didn't come out to leave out. I'm a Levite. I have to go. No, they, no, we all have choice to make. And when we heard the gospel, there was a time we heard it, we believed it, and God brought us back to the place of living where he began that work in us again that had been stopped for who knows how long, different for all of us. But now because we're alive, we can watch and we can strengthen the things, the others that remain. As I've heard it told me over the last few years that nobody is coming back to Calvary until they realize what they're trusting in doesn't work. If you're in the government of 12 or you think your deliverance and your victories are coming through your fasting and you're this and you're that, you're not coming back to the cross even though you're deceived and none of that's working for you. I even have heard some cross preachers make the comment, God honored it every once in a while back then when I didn't know it. No, he never did. He can't honor what you do for any part of salvation. None of it. 
So when I hear preachers say that, I don't condemn them. I just think, well, they're just not far enough along yet, but thank God they're coming. We've all said some dumb things through the years. I like Brother Dale when I hear him telling folks, I heard him when he was preaching in Bloomberg. He says the same thing every time. He sure was green, but he's come a long way. Thank God y'all been patient with me and let me grow, and I'm patient with you. And we're patient with each other, and we're watching, and we're strengthening those that remain. We're not, and this confirms what God told me years ago. I've not called you, Curtis, to corral the goats, but to feed the sheep. The goats can go out there and butt heads and live like they want to, and 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 and, and just they they can get on Facebook. And that's pretty much what Facebook is. Facebook. I can be whatever I want to be. I don't have to be faithful in church, but I can get on Facebook, and boy, I can make it sound like I'm the most faithful person in the city. Now, I can't wait till some of them people, hey, uh, and they have before. Does that guy go to your church? No, not very much. And they're like, what? I don't mind telling them. I don't mind telling them. I just tell it like it is. They're on fake book, and boy, they're the most, boy, they're the most powerful Christian out there today, and they can't even be faithful to the house of God. Mm. Mm-hmm. I like it when it's real. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. What a letter to be sitting in church and get one Sunday. You're dead. You thought you were alive. You thought you really had it going on. Listen, the message of the cross over the airwaves, direct TV, dish TV, Sun Life Radio, and I'm talking about SBN, and now all these other churches that are online, on Facebook, and some of us preaching the gospel on Facebook, and uh, for some it's Facebook, but all the, all the opportunities are out there, and all these churches, man, that person told me one time down there in that, uh, at that church in Texas when I told them about when they posted Bon Jovi music in their church, that guy told me, he said, if you ever visit our church one time, you'll never go back to your church. You know why they think that? Because they think they got a church that's alive. And if they had any kind of ears to hear what the Spirit of God was saying, they wouldn't one soul be in that building. If you look down in verse 6, and I just want to say this at this point, so we can back up. But this is the main thing right here. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. If you can't hear, you're blind. And Jesus thought it so important how you hear and what you hear that he taught on that. That those who have proper hearing will receive more hearing. And those who don't have proper hearing will lose even that which they seem to have. That's what he taught. So it's very important. Well, who are they who have ears to hear the Spirit? Now, that's going to be settled at the end when Jesus comes to straighten us all out. But we just have to stick with the Scriptures and understand Jesus said the Scriptures are about him. So here at Crossway Church, we like to say this down through the years, we're a walk with Jesus church. That's why most folk can't come here and stay here because they only think they want to walk with Jesus, but they won't go through what it takes. They won't learn the word. They don't know it. They won't, they won't be this sincere with the Lord. <coughs> now, I'm not talking about you got to come to Crossway Church because you don't. But I'm talking about this church is not about jokes and not about all these other things. We're about the Scriptures. We are about the Scriptures, the truth of God's Word. So, let's look at verse 2 again. He says in the end of verse 2, For I have not found your works perfect before God. Now notice this, God's looking for a perfect work. We can't do a perfect work. Only He can do a perfect work. So here we see he's eliminated. We see it again. You're dead, which means we're denying him. If if, if we're dead, we're not experiencing life. Christ, to live is Christ. To die, to to be dead is to deny Christ. And the only way to accept and to experience Christ is our life is through faith in the sacrifice. And we'll see that in these 
Scriptures right here <coughs> and some more. So he says, I've not found your works perfect before God. And again, the church today, they don't really want to talk about works because we're not saved by works, but yet we're ordained to work. We're called unto works, ordained unto works. And, it, and we're called unto a perfect work. But here's why we write it off. Works don't get us into heaven, and I can't do anything perfect. That's absolutely right. But Jesus saved us, and he can do the perfect work. But it takes our faith in him and what he did to be able to live in and give us the experience of him living in us. It's called abiding in him. That means remaining, continuing in him. I've not found your works perfect before God. And when you look that word up, perfect, it means complete. Now, most of your commentaries, because they don't know the message of the cross, they don't have it for sanctified, they don't have the illumination of God's word, most of your past commentaries do not have that. Only Brother Swaggart, and maybe there might be a handful more, but most commentaries you read about this are going to say they weren't doing everything they should have been doing. But that's not the problem. They weren't finishing what they started. That's not the problem. The problem is Christ was eliminated. Are y'all okay tonight? Y'all just taking it all in? Or? That's the problem. See, we always look at what's going on, but we got to back up like a doctor and see why is that going on? Why is that not going on? Because Christ is being denied. Again, let me say it. Keep driving it in you. If you're dead, that means you're not experiencing Christ because to live is Christ. To experience, Paul told Timothy, lay hold on eternal life. Well, how do you do that? He told him, fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on this eternal life you've got. That means seize it, experience it. Where's my amen sign? I know I threw it a mile the other day. I'll just tape it right here, praise God. <laughs> I've not found your works perfect before God. Before we move on, just let me say this. God's looking for the perfect work he can do. Every day of your life. He's not taking breaks, and I'm not talking about some legalistic something. I'm talking about just a surrender to Christ. I'm talking about an intimate, loving relationship with him that keeps their faith in him, allows him to change them, him to do the work that gets done through faith in the sacrifice. True biblical faith in the sacrifice allows him to be life to us. Nothing else can do that. Me going to church ain't going to get me nothing if my faith is not right. Here's the proof of that. Church folk, you're dead. Amen. He says in verse 3, and note we could stay, we could stay in one verse for a long time. Couldn't we, Brother Jimmy? Jimmy teaches Sunday school and... Uh, they have a marvelous time out there breaking the scriptures down. I hear all about it. Good stuff. Verse 3 says, Remember therefore, here comes, here comes the answer, here comes the instruction, here comes the encouragement, here comes the direction to get them where they need to be. Remember therefore how you have received and heard. And hold fast to that and repent. Repent means change your mind. you got to let that go. Your mind plays a part in the way you live and function. You're thinking. You understand that, don't you? What is it, Proverbs 16, 3? It says, commit your works unto the Lord and he will establish your thinking. And if he's not establishing your thinking, my friend, your thinking is stinking. It's bad thinking. It'll get you in trouble. So he says this, remember therefore how you have received and heard and hold fast and repent. Now I want to read another scripture at this time if I can open my note here. Uh, it'll get it. First John 2 and 24. 
I just love this iPad. I'm going to say it all the time. I was telling Andrew, uh, he's going to be going to Palestine and preaching here uh, in, a co- in, in about a month and a half. And I was asking him, did he have anything on his, his little computer where he could do his preaching, have his Bible, and record too? Because, man, that's, I, I mean, that's, that's so awesome. If that camera and stuff ain't working, I hope it works every service. But we'll always have audio uh, because it's, you, you can record and have your Bible and your notes and any other thing just right here. Isn't that technology something? We're not going to need it in the new millennium, though. 1 John 2, 24, there it's not, but here it is. Let that therefore abide in you, 1 John 2 and 24. Let that, everybody say that. Therefore abide in you which you have heard from the beginning. If that, everybody say that. If that which you have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, you shall also continue in the Son and in the Father. Church in Sardis, they wasn't continuing. They were dead. The abiding had stopped. The continuing had stopped. The remaining had stopped. It was over. They're dead. The experience of life was over. But yet they had a name that they were alive. See, it don't matter what men say to you. The Bible does say, let no man steal your crown because men will come up and, boy, they'll puff you up. Boy, you're the finest preacher I've ever heard. Glory to God. Oh, you're like King David today. Boy, they, you'll go home eating that bologna sandwich. Head be that big. Come that evening, boy, something will happen and that old head go, woo, 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 woo. These preachers, man, in these churches, they are dead. If they're not using the scriptures to point to Calvary, they are dead. I didn't say it. Jesus said it. They are dead. They have a name that they're alive, but they are dead. you got to go back to that which you heard in the beginning. And if you cling to that which you heard in the beginning, then you will continue in the Father and the Son. But there is no continuing with the Lord in agreement with the Lord. Lord, unless you keep hearing what you heard and received the way you heard in the beginning. Everything else is make-believe and only has a billboard encircled you that says, I'm alive, but from heaven, God says, you're dead. You're dead. The community boasts in you being alive. Man, that's the finest preacher. That's the finest music. Oh, man, take your kids there. They've got the best program for kids. Oh, they've got all this. But they're not pointing them to the cross. They're dead. I said they're dead. The Lord said they're dead. Remember, therefore, how you have received and heard. There's only one way to hear and one way to receive, and that's through faith in the sacrifice. Now, it's a shame we didn't know all that in the beginning of our salvation that we had to keep believing that. We had to keep hearing that. For again, my testimony was that I just heard in the distance the gospel in its most minute form spoken form, spoken in the background on my job almost 25 years ago next month, and the Lord quickened me through that gospel because that's all he uses to quicken man's spirit and soul is the gospel. When you believe something else, you're already dying. You may have horrible things that happen to you, but God won't quicken you through those things unless it's the gospel you turn to and you hear. The bad circumstances God don't use to quicken you. Where is that in the Bible? It's not in the Bible. The Bible says he quickened us together with him when he died for our sins. Think about that. Now in verse 3, he tells them, The answer is for you to remember how you received and heard and and to hold fast to that and to repent. That means this other stuff you've moved into, you've got to let that go. You've got to let that go. You did not hear about the government of 12 in the beginning, and that's not what saved you. If you think it is, you're still lost. Anything you've done never saved you. People that think they did something to get saved are still lost. 
and people who think they're doing works to be sanctified are, be, are, are separated from the Lord. Galatians 5, 1 through 4 and Galatians 1 and verse 6. Watch this now. The word repent is here because it's important. It means you've got to turn around. You have got to hear more than a message. You've got to let this message change your life. You've got to let this message, this letter that come into Sardis, if you don't let that message quicken you, if you don't have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying, you are going to die with the rest of the dead. Watch. If therefore you shall not watch, I will come on you as a thief and you shall not know what hour I will come on you. Now, if you go back to the, the chapter previous to this, chapter 2, the church in Ephesus, the warning is that if they don't get back to where they were, he's going to show up and remove their lampstand, their light. Think about this. Now, the church, if you're, if you're stuck in the once saved, always saved, you don't even know what to do with this. You don't, you, you don't know what to do with this. You read it and you have to make stuff up because surely it can't be for the church. But it is. He tells the church, the ones who can hear, the ones who have ears to hear. Remember, some of them are dead and others are getting ready to die. Because let me tell you something, folks. The ones who are dead, they have an impact on you, and you'll have to fight the good fight of faith to keep going because every unfaithful Christian has a great effect on the faithful Christians. Those who are among us who refuse to do what they should do and they just continually not do what they should do, they have a negative effect on us, especially me, the pastor. And they're going to answer for that. I can't tell you where the scriptures are. I've not looked into it lately. But you ain't supposed to put a burden on your preacher. And I'm burdened over some folk in this church. They just can't obey the rules. They just won't get involved. They, they're, 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 it's like they're just religious. They're playing games with God. And they think they're faking, uh, faking people. Listen, they're not even faking me out. I can be faked out, but they ain't faking me out. It's just obvious. And I ain't being ugly tonight, but I am being real. And this is the kind of church I pastor where it gets real. It got real in Sardis. I'm sure the dead folks said, let's go get pizza. We got to get out of here. We ain't coming back here. This gone too far now, telling us we dead. And the folk in here, these other folk, and let me tell you something, the dead know who the ones are that ain't dead. And the ones that ain't dead know who the ones are that are dead. We're not talking about wheat and tares. We're talking about wheat, and some of them have died. I know it's a little personal tonight. Now watch this. Verse 4. You have a few names in Sardis which have not defiled their garments. Here, here confirms verse 2, be watchful and strengthen the things, those that are remaining. Those that aren't dead yet, but they're getting ready to die too. Preacher, messenger, they're getting ready to die. But there's a few names in Sardis which have not defiled their garments. Think about that. The church can defile their garments. Once saved, always saved. No, nope, can't be defiled. Here it is in the Bible. And I know they'll go as far as to say there were lost people. But this ain't talking about lost people. And typically, lost people didn't show up in church back in that day. Typically, today most think the church is a place the lost can run in and go get saved. I'm going to tell you, in the early church, there wasn't many lost folks showing up at church because you had to denounce everything to become a Christian. And, and, I mean, it had to be known. Your family would get rid of you, throw you out. But you still got a few names in Sardis which have not defiled their garments. 
And that means stained their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Revelation 19, 7 and 8 says this. Let us be glad and rejoice. Again, this is Revelation 19, 7 and 8. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife, that's us, has made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should array, be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. Now, I've been teaching on righteousness since 2015. Since 2015. I'm still teaching on it every Friday morning out there in that studio, led by the Spirit of God to teach on righteousness. Preached an entire series, 12 CD set on righteousness. Still, and looking at my notes, I look back, and my Lord, I've been teaching righteousness since 2015. It's important because righteousness is not just who we are in Christ, but it's where the only way that we can, it's also the fruit that has to be bare. Fruits of righteousness. Some of these folk here, they're dead. That means there is no fruit of his righteousness. See, the perfect work is a work that produces righteousness unto holiness. You have a few names in Sardis which have not defiled their garments. Boy, those that are dead right now, and they're sitting there in the chairs in Sardis, and they're thinking, good Lord, is this almost over? See, that's what the dead do. They're dead. We need to get back there and get to our programs again. We, you know. But there's a few names in Sardis which have not defiled their garment. Now, can you imagine getting a letter from John, and it's of the Lord? When you're sitting in the congregation, and there's all of a sudden some division taking place because some folks are being told they're dead. Some of y'all are dead. But there's a few of you who hadn't stained your garments yet. Now I'm telling you, next Sunday, there's some folk wasn't at church. They went across town, started their own dead work. But look at the promise. The ones that have not defiled their garments, the promise is they shall walk with me in white for they are worthy. What is it that makes us worthy to walk with the Lord? His righteousness. His work of righteousness. Well, I go to church every Sunday. I give in the offering. I, man, I do this, I do that. Man, I'm worthy to walk with the Lord. No, you could be dead. You could be doing all that and have a name that you're alive, but you could be dead because it's not the doing of all those things. It is faith in Christ and Him crucified and Him working in you to change you and through you to change a lost world and to bring a backslidden church home. Think about that. What makes us, what, what allows Jesus to say we're worthy? And I know we say it all the time, we're, well, I'm not worthy and we're not worthy of anything we have, but Jesus said, if you've not stained your garments, if you're continuing on in the faith, then you are continuing on in the Son and the Father, and you are worthy to walk with me. That means everybody is not. And it just goes right along with other scriptures. How can two walk together unless they be agreed. And here where you can be using the word of God, but if you're not agreement in agreement with God through the truth of his word, which always points you to Christ and his work at Calvary, if that's not where my faith is, I'm not in agreement with God. And I'm not walking with God. I'm not worthy to walk with God because I've become dead. And as I said earlier, the, the message of the cross, the truth, the gospel, it's going out all over the world now, practically. It, it's, in America, if you've got DirecTV or Dish Network, you've got the gospel. You have access to the gospel. And many people sit there and they'll listen to it or, and they'll mock somebody speaking in tongues or they'll go on through it. And I'm talking about people that claim to be Christians. The gospel is going out today. 
And we do, I do occasionally wonder, Lord, why, why was I convicted? Why, why was I living as though I was dead? And, and then all of a sudden, I believed. Why? And I don't really have an answer for that. Except there was possibly the answer is a fear that God sees in your heart. Because the Bible says the see in Psalms 25, 14, the secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. So there's something about that fear of the Lord. There's something about that word fear that God sees probably in a different way than we see it. Because not everybody who's got to show that they're living for God and they've got a name that they're alive and that they're flowing in the Holy Ghost is really alive. Jesus showed up and said, you got a name that you are, but you're dead. See, it's not by outer appearance Jesus taught that we judge, but it's righteous judgment. John 7, 24, if you're taking notes. Man, this is good tonight. This is why every single day you and I should wake up with a greater thankfulness than we've ever had before because the Lord found us, he saved us, we got away from him, he showed up and pretty much gave us a message like this, maybe not in this form, but he dealt with us. We were convicted for believing wrong things and he was able to bring us back to him to continue with him through faith in the sacrifice. The only place that you can be declared righteous and bear forth his righteous fruits. That is the perfect work. That is the perfect work. He says this in verse 5. I've got to hurry now. Y'all have made me take the whole hour. He that overcomes the same, he that overcomes. Overcomes what? What are they being told? The question is, even for us today, we hear a message like this, will it just be another message we sit through or will it really have quickened us in our hearts to pay more attention and to do what the Bible says here, watch. Are we really watching? Not everybody else, our own selves. Because here's where we got to watch. We got to watch us. Man, I'll run off in a heartbeat. I got to watch myself. But I can't even watch myself good enough. I have to give myself to the Lord to be watched. He that overcomes. He that overcomes. He that, go back. He that repents. He that remembers how he heard and received. He that holds fast to that. He that repents. He that overcomes through repentance. God, I'm sorry you caught me off down a wrong path. I've been deceived. I've been beguiled. I've, I've been carried away through the lust of my own flesh. I, I can't even blame the false prophets. It was my heart that got carried away. I'm responsible. I can't blame them. God, I'm changing. Oh, show me the truth, Lord. That's what happens. That's the breakdown. That's the repentant mind and heart. Not I was wrong only, that I did wrong, but I've been wrong. I can't blame anybody else. There's always been false prophets. How did I get hooked up with them? Because they were offering something my flesh lusted after. He that overcomes the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. And the reason commentators in past ages, even some of the best ones I'm reading behind now, say some of the, and I'm not being ugly, but ignorant comments they make is because they can't fathom this being real because they're so beat down with heresy, the once saved, always saved, false, damnable doctrine. They, they, they have to say something that people like us can't even understand. What are they talking about? Because, you, you listen, no man can pluck you out of the hand of God, but you can walk right out of it yourself. If you couldn't, we, need, we wouldn't need to be warned about not being beguiled or not being deceived or let no man steal your crown. That just wouldn't be possibilities. 
the church in Sardis wouldn't have needed a letter. We'd just all tiptoe through the tulips right into heaven. Hallelujah. But here the letter shows up and said, you ain't all going. Yeah, that's what they said. You're not all going unless you repent. Because I've caught you right where you are. You think you're alive, you're dead. And unless you repent and hold fast, remember what you heard and received, hold fast to that, repent, you're not going to make it. You see, just because you got in don't mean you're going to make it to the end. And here's something the Lord was showing me today in my studies of this scripture in Matthew 25. We all need to go back and read that. And I posted something about it, just one of them one-liners on Facebook. It's not what you got. This, this story proves that. It's not what you got that's the most important thing. It's what you do with what you have. Jesus taught that in Matthew 25. He gave him talents, him talents, and him talents. And he comes back and he got the increase from this one, the increase from that one. He said, well, where's the increase? He said, I didn't get any increase. I just put it over here. And he made up these excuses. He had no works. Jesus said, it's not people who say unto me, Lord, Lord, it's going into the kingdom of heaven. It's those who do the will of the Father. And again, he's not talking about you work your way into heaven because you, ca you can't do that. The, the price for salvation is too measure. The only thing that can pay for it is the blood of Jesus. But once you're in the kingdom, you're called and ordained unto good works, a perfect work. And again... Don't let, don't let the flesh and the devil tell you, but we can't do a perfect work because that's a fact, but facts will make us quit. The truth is Jesus did the perfect work. Jesus will continue the perfect work in us if we keep our faith in him and not something we're doing in him and what he did at Calvary. It's more than something for you to think about tonight. This is a message for all of us who hear in this. That you better become very watchful that Christianity is not what most think it is. To God, it is a perfect work he's looking for. And when he can't find it, he's sending a messenger of warning. And if that's not heeded, let me tell you, he's going to come on you as a thief and remove some things that you're not going to be happy about. Yeah, you probably, you're not going to be happy about it, but you're going to keep rocking along like you're still walking in the light and you're not in the light, like you're living but you're not living. These people thought they were alive, thought they were living, man. They were dead. I was there. I speak and I preach from experience tonight. I'm not talking about things I don't know about, but my, my dilemma, my, my experience came, resulted in a crash. Well, I'm not going into all that, but God sometimes, many times, allows crashes in our lives because when things begin to fall apart, you're going to get still for a minute and look for God. God, why? What's going on, God? How about this church gets this letter? What's going on, God? Am I dead? Am I dead? They knew who they were. They knew who they were. There was a quickening of the spirit when this letter was read. They knew who they were because they knew those that weren't hearing and receiving the way they began, they knew who they were. They know who they are today, but they kick against the pricks of this message. They value the relationships and false unity greater than the truth of the gospel. Thank God for people like you. Thank God for people like you. What God was able to do in you, I'll put it that way. But he's able to do in anybody what he did in us if they'll just repent and believe. Again, we're not robots. God hadn't got a few picked out that he's going to do a work in. That doesn't work that way. Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whoever heard this and would repent, could begin to experience life and not have to worry about their name being blotted out of the Lamb's book of life. 
See, some people think they don't even have to worry about that, but the Bible says different. The Bible says different, and I'm going to stick with the Bible, and I know you are too. Stand with me tonight. Praise God.